Here we have Dr. Tom, who's from Growmore, which is an awesome chemical provider to Monster Gardens. He is also an entomologist and has an extensive history in not just the chemical aspect of mitigating pests, but also from the entomology standpoint. So Tom, what is your thoughts on Avid? It's a product that we've never been behind because we've known gardeners who've had chemical reactions to it. Um, can you describe a little bit, since you know the chemistry of the product pretty decently, of what you think that solution should, or at least what the gardener should know of that solution if they're choosing it? Yeah, I'd be happy to discuss it. It's a very, very effective miticide, and it um, it's a fermentation-based product, meaning it's grown in a large fermenter like you would be brewing beer. And it's a fungal fermentation. It's a fungal pa a toxin that is extracted from, um, again, in a fungus in a submerged fermentation. It's been a very, very, very successful product that came from Merck Sharp and Dome originally and now it's owned by Bayer Chemical Company. The challenge I have with it is not that it's a fermentation or a natural product, is that it has a very high mammalian toxicity, meaning a little bit of it is very toxic. And it's extremely effective on mites. Uh, we used to use a lot of uh, impede or safer soap to move it into the plant more effectively. But the key issue here is you need to be aware just because something comes from a fermentation doesn't mean that it's a safe and selective product. And in fact, if it has a, a, a very acute mammalian toxicity, in this case, that, that stuff on the realm of uh, some other pesticides people might know, something like malathion, which is considered a, a pretty toxic material, and you would hear the thion in that and say, mm -hmm. I don't want that Red on my flag. truck. Yeah. Red flag. Avermectin is more toxic than that, okay? And if even you, more toxic. Even more toxic. And what we do as scientists is we look at what's called the LD50 oral rat. They feed it to a rat and figure out how much it takes to kill a rat. And it's a pretty, it's a hot material and it's something that um, you wouldn't think it, but here's an interesting analogy. You think about in nature, there are a bunch of bacteria that occur in soil. Clostridium botulinum, botulism, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, tetanus, mm -hmm. uh, tetanus. You wouldn't want to put tetanus toxin on something that you were going to eat, mm -hmm. or you wouldn't want to put botulism toxin on something you're going to eat. Mm -hmm. These natural toxins that are produced by a fungus in nature are there to kill something, and sometimes we extract them because they'll kill a mite very effectively, but that doesn't mean they're safe and selective. So you have to be educated and you have to ask something like this. The companies, they don't register it into things where people would be using it for the uses that... Um, food they, production. Food production, like yeah. So it'll be on, it, and in fact, when it is... Ornamental flower Yeah, ornamental flower. It'll be used on ornamentals. Avid is a, a name from the ornamentals. In, in the field, it would be called something different. And if it were to be used on mites, on strawberries, it would be used in a way that the residue levels are fully understood so that a strawberry would never be gone to market with anything that would be considered not a hundredfold safe for a human. Well, what if people are smoking their crop or vaporizing their crop and there's no washing method uh, through the process of crop take down to market. Uh, what is your thought on using something like Avid? I think you should be very cautious with something like that. Your move, creep. Because you're going into a realm of that something that's not a, it's an off-label use for a product like uh -huh. that. And those labels, whether you like the government or not in these situations, you have to have faith in the fact that that stuff's been well studied because companies behind it don't want to hurt anybody. And smoking something that could be very toxic like that it's like years ago when herbicides were used to try to remove things in the environment and uh, there's an issue there. You don't want things that are being ingested into into a human that are not well understood. And the residual is quite a bit on the plant. I'm guessing you spray it on, but weeks later there's still, I'm guessing, some residue. Yeah, Especially really, if you're not washing the plant. Yeah, I can't comment to how quickly it breaks down or that particular material, but what I do have a lot of faith in is in the field crop production, like on strawberries, where that's been a management tool for 30 years. Mm -hmm. We have very very good and safe residue management levels in this country. Mm -hmm. So we know after years and millions of dollars of research on uh -huh. when you could spray a strawberry and have it be safe to go to market with the residue of that material, mm -hmm. that's managed on a global basis, on a daily basis. Most people don't know how extensive that system is, but when you take it off label, 
put it on something that you were going to vaporize or smoke, you're in unknown territory there, and there's just no reason to sink. Yeah, to there's no that. reason to use that as a tool for no, pest mitigation. Bad idea. And if you have, just know that you probably brought a product to market that probably has toxicity that you might not have been aware of. Yeah. And and produce is washed multiple times, not just from the production facility, but before you put it in your mouth when you get it from the store. So yeah. a lot of these products that people are consuming aren't necessarily washed. And let's take it another step further. If they're doing extraction and concentrating the product, they're concentrating the problem, right? Well, it could be. Again, I think in the concentration in that extraction process is probably going to break down that molecule. Mm -hmm. And again, it gets into very complicated chemistry. But again, when you go away from the areas where people focused on what is, is safe and managed correctly and what we know is logical um, science, there's a big incentive for companies to understand all that. It costs a lot of money for chemical companies mm -hmm. like Merck or Bayer to understand their labels. Mm -hmm. Those labels, uh, I have complete faith in our food safety system that way, mm -hmm. and of uh, pesticide use, and even ones that are now, say, with a warning label, we don't have any of those anymore. We're down to caution labels. But we understand that residue management, and we understand the fate in humans. Those studies cost millions and millions of dollars, and they're performed. I don't know of anybody who's looked at these off-label uses, mm -hmm. and that's why we don't, as professionals, ever recommend things that are off-label. It's a liability issue, too, that you're bad. selling something off-label, and what if you do make someone sick? Mm -hmm. We, none of us want that. And, if the pro and the produce is, you know, let's say if it's if it's not being cleaned before it goes to market, you really want as, as more of a natural solution as you can get through the whole process of that production. Yeah, and as we've talked today, we have so many integrated selective management tools, you know, things like these, these soaps and these detergents and things to control mites that we can use an integrated approach and get away from anything that might be toxic like that. Well, thank you so much for this information. It's really helped, I'm sure. or listeners to understand what the best tools are and what tools aren't the best to be using. So thank you, Tom. You're really welcome.